Hello and welcome to the YouTube version of the Soulful Self Podcast. I'm your host, Chelsea Cora, and I am so super excited that you are here. This podcast is a resource for all beings to grow personally, heal emotionally, and align with our highest spiritual involvement above all else. This podcast is a reminder that we are all spiritual beings having a human experience rather than simple human beings having a spiritual experience. So if this message resonates with you, if you want to see human consciousness elevated to its highest possible timeline, I'm going to invite you to support this free resource by simply liking this video, subscribing to my channel, and commenting your own thoughts and feedback in the comment section below. These simple actions can really go a long way, so I appreciate your consideration. And now, let's jump into today's episode. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 89 of the Soulful Self Podcast. I am your host, Chelsea Cora, and today is a very exciting episode because I am joined by a special guest, Alyssa Rushton. Alyssa Rushton is an energy intuitive, a transformational teacher, and a near-death survivor. In the year 2005, Alyssa was 27 years old and she found her physical health riddled with various diseases and major illnesses and addictions. And she actually was completely overweight and overmedicated on about 28 prescription medications. She had to use a walker to get around. And she ended up having a near death experience where she actually died while using the restroom one night. And her consciousness returned back to source or to God consciousness. And as she traveled through these realms, she gained so much incredible, fascinating, and life-changing wisdom and insights, a lot of which she shares with us on this interview today. She also shares the incredible story of her spiritual awakening journey, as well as some modalities that have helped her heal her body, mind, and soul. Above all else, Alyssa is here to share the message with all of us that we are all, in fact, divine co-creators, that we are all light, and that we all have everything that we need already inside of us. So I mean it when I say I am super excited to present this interview to all of you today. So let us all give a very warm welcome to our special guest, Alyssa Rushton. Alyssa Rushton, welcome to the Soulful Self Podcast. It's such an honor to have you here today. How are you? I'm wonderful and I'm super thrilled to be here. I'm actually a big fan of the show. Okay, perfect. Well, that's awesome. So in order to introduce yourself a little more personally to our audience members today, I'm going to ask you an icebreaker question, which is to describe a little bit about your cultural upbringing and background. Yeah, so I was raised in a very average house. I grew up in Portland, Oregon on a very average street, although now it's kind of a cool street, but back then it was not the cool street. It was just an average street. And I was raised in the Christian church and it was an interesting upbringing because my father at one time had been training with Billy Graham and who's a big evangelical guy. And he got kicked out of that program Mm -hmm. for doing all the things that you're not supposed to do, like drinking and smoking and playing cards, Mm -hmm. you know, back in the the day you had to sign a document and dad got caught doing all those things. So anyways, I grew up in the church and we were very active in the church. I always tell people that we only went to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, whether we needed it or not. So we were going a lot and I got involved in the choir because that was just sort of what I think the trajectory that my dad was, he was a speaker and a singer. And I ended up actually at a very young age, getting a lot of roles in the choir. And at one point, I forget how old I was. I think I was about 11, maybe 12. And I was asked to sing on stage with the Bill Gaither trio in the Portland Memorial Coliseum, which is a a rather large event. And it's probably about 10,000 people in the Coliseum. And so it's quite the way to start yourself off as a young kiddo. And I then traveled with my mom we would go on these mission trips and i remember going to thailand and in thailand i met the most 
oh, Chelsea, the most gorgeous people. They were glowy and lit up and happy and shared everything with me, the foreigner and with us. And I remember asking the, we had a pastor with us and I remember asking him, you know, do you think these people go to hell? And he said, oh, absolutely. You know, if they don't believe in Jesus, then yes, they go to hell. (laughs) I know. And in that moment, I was 12 and I thought, I can't believe in this religion anymore. And I, and I started to tap out of religion. So that was kind of my upbringing. But then when I got back from that trip and a couple things happened in my life, I ended up dropping out of high school when I was four, uh, I'm sorry, when I was 15. And I had, we had just moved from our, you know, average place to this kind of inner city place and a huge high school, 3,000 kids in it. And I felt really out of control. I fell in line with a bunch of kids that smoked and did drugs and I was accepted instantly into that crowd. And I just started to go down a bad trajectory. And I ended up thinking, you know, I don't think this school thing is for me. And so I ended up dropping out of high school and got a job working at Pizza Hut waiting tables. And that was the start of my corporate career where, you know, it led me uh, into many different places. So, yeah, that's my that's my upbringing and what my little start in life. OK, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing and opening up about those details. It's a very unique story and it gets even more unique, which is why I want to ask about what your spiritual transformation journey has been like. Mm. This is such a great question, Chelsea, because, you know, as you can imagine growing up in the church, I wasn't spiritual, I was religious in that context. I wasn't taught how to connect with myself, Mm -hmm. but at a young age, I had this knowing or this feeling that I was going to be, I called it a pastor. I had, I had written down in my journal, I think I'm going to be a pastor someday. And to me, that meant somebody who preaches about God. And so obviously I then, I never went back to church much after that time in Thailand because I couldn't believe in a religion. I just couldn't get behind a religion that would tell me these you know, incredible people are going to hell. And I sort of didn't think I believed in hell anyways. Mm -hmm. So uh, fast forward, you know, I'm working at Pizza Hut. Then I decided to get some different jobs. And I, um, I was in my 20s. And I remember being very guided to go take some Reiki classes. And I ended up taking some college classes with this um, guy who was teaching from the Celestine Prophecy book. And he was teaching from this book. And I thought, wow, how cool is this that he's teaching from this fictional book? But it was so enlightening and so opening for me. But at the same time, there was something that was really frightening about it because my spiritual gifts were coming online. And I remember one day I walked into the classroom and I saw this man and he looked yellow to me and I knew his kidneys weren't working well. And I just walked up to him completely inappropriate. I just blurted out, I think your kidneys are in trouble. And he said, how could you possibly know that? And I said, I just feel, I feel it's important that you, that, you know, he's like, I already do know. And so that really scared me. And shortly thereafter, I stopped going to those classes and I got hired at a fortune 500 telecommunications company and the trajectory of me going into the spiritual world that I was really headed down really shifted when I got into the corporate culture and then this working, 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 doing, 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 achieving, achieving, achieving mode that I got into. Yeah. So you said that your spiritual gifts started to come online. And obviously one of them has to do with medical intuition, right? Being able to see what kind of physical ailments people are moving through. But I'm wondering how else would you describe those spiritual gifts coming online at that time? Yeah, for me, you know, ever since I was a kid, my mom, I think when I was I want to say five, but I don't, I couldn't really read all that well at five, but a very early age, five to seven, she taught me the Silva method. So the going into the alpha brainwave state, she gave me the book, the Silva method, and I would thumb through it and try to digest it as much as I could. 
And so I was working with that intuition. I was working with that inner knowing. For me, it was, I could, I could see things for people. I could see energies on people. I could, I would know things in advance, but back then I had no training at all. So I didn't know what I was picking up on and I had no boundaries and I would just blurt things out to people and I would sense everybody's energy. So part of what I do now, I'm a body channel and I personally think actually most people are body channels. They just don't know how to work mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. you know, most people feel other people so strongly. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how to work with that energy. In fact, they think it's them. And I remember one of my biggest ahas ever. I walked into a store and the clerk in the store was fuming mad. And I had just walked in and I, and I could feel how mad they were. And I said to this clerk, D have I done something to upset you? And she barked at me. No, of course not. And I left that store and I had the download. It's not you. You have to remember it's not you. You are feeling her energy. You don't cause her to have that energy. Mm -hmm. And so it was that kind of stuff that started to happen for me where I started to get little mini understandings and little mini downloads. But you have to remember also at the time I was very cut off. I was smoking. Mm -hmm. two packs of cigarettes a day whether i needed them or not i was drinking a nice bottle of cabernet every day mm -hmm. and overworking so my channel that the information comes through i feel like was really very clogged so i didn't have the greatest perspective or at least the perspective that i do now on this information and how to work with it because of the clogginess of the the information that was coming through if that makes any sense yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah but pretty amazing that it was coming through still in powerful spurts you could say and so you were kind of struggling with some addictive or escapist behaviors and i know that a big part of your story is those behaviors leading to sort of a rock bottom and i would love if you could explain that yes so I, like everybody, had traumas happen in my life, mm -hmm. you know, and there's little traumas and big traumas and I've had them all. I was at, at the, at the workplace, I was kidnapped and my life was threatened. And that was a big one. I was 21 at the time and mm -hmm. I really struggled with that, but there was a bunch of traumas before that as a kid. I mean, dropping out of high school is traumatic and working for your own money when you're 15 is traumatic. And all of these little things that I had no skills to deal with. I had no tools or a framework to even express my emotions because probably like a lot of the listeners listening to this, it really wasn't an acceptable thing to do back then. I mean, you, in my family, it was, we were just taught, you know, for good or for better, or for worse, just suck it up and move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to talk about this. Let's just move on. Um, let's drink a little, let's have a little wine and smoke a cigarette, throw some dirt on top of it and pretend it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that led to a lot of numbing out and my numbing out was, overworking first and foremost, burying myself in work. It was addiction, cigarettes and alcohol. And then what happened at, in corporate America, I, I actually love that job. It was amazing. I was a trainer, a sales trainer for this company. And I got promoted out of that job, which at the time I was wanting to keep climbing the corporate ladder. Cause you gotta imagine I'm a high school dropout with no college degree. And here I am at corporate headquarters you know, climbing the corporate ladder. So I'm thinking this is great, but I got promoted into the gray cubicle of death. And you know, the one mm -hmm. where you're in the box all day and you're just, you're just working and it's competitive because everybody's working for that director spot. And it's just, you're trying to climb, climb the corporate ladder. And it was so stressful. And I ended up getting really sick there i got pneumonia first and i just started the spiral downward and after i got pneumonia and mono i had to take a leave of absence so i took this quick leave of absence 
And this was, was this was after the kidnapping happened? That yeah, way? this is several years after that. Because, you know, I didn't really oh, wow. deal with it. I just buried it. I just buried it deep. Keep burying it. Keep overworking. Keep piling this stuff on top. Mm -hmm. Don't want to think about that. Right. Okay. So I'm curious if you're open to explaining as much as you feel comfortable about that particular event. Oh, about the kidnapping? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm happy to share, and it might be just a trigger warning for people. So um, in that, and here's a cool, here's a cool story about intuition. When I got hired at this corporation, which is a if I were to say the name, you'd know exactly who it is. And I'm not saying it for a reason. Okay. Um, so I knew not to take the job. I This was at the time when I was going into these Reiki classes and I was developing my spirituality. And a friend approached me and said, hey, we want to hire you. I had worked with them at another company. And they said, we want to hire you for this job. And they told me about a person that would also be working at this retail store. So they were opening up the first ever cell phone retail stores at the time. And um, so I knew intuitively, no, this is a no go. Do not do this. You will not be safe is what I heard. Oh. But I was dazzled with the paycheck and the salary offer that they gave me. I'd ne you know, I'd never gotten anything like that. I'd never gotten a huge, you know, salary offer a letter before. That was just, I'm 20 at the time. I mean, oh, wow. wow. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I haven't graduated from high school. So of course. So I literally heard, don't do it. You're not going to be safe. This isn't your path. And I <laughs> saw it being very dark, but I took the path. I got I got wooed. I, I overrode my intuition. And so we were opening up this cell phone store and um, the person I was working with was unsteady, to say the least. And um, basically one day they came in, I was at the store by myself setting some things up and I was working at the computer and I was in the manager's office because I was one of the folks that was kind of setting things up. And he came in and he had a, a couple of set of shackles and a lock that would lock a door that wouldn't normally lock. So oh, if wow. you can imagine you're in now a small office and I'm working at the computer and I, I see this um, person kind of from the back of my head. I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? And he's like, oh, good. And he's kind of fiddling around and I finally turn around and he's at the door and he's like, hey, I wanna show you you're not getting out of this room today. Oh, wow. And that was my sh shocking wake up, like, oh, God, moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, I, I'm still not exactly sure how long it was. It was, you know, he, sh he shackled my hands um, behind my back and shackled my feet, not regular handcuffs, but like full on hardcore shackles, right? Wow. Uh, the kind they use on prisoners and um it was just a series of threats and intimidations about taking my life and how you know he had made up this whole story in his head about how i was making him look bad and the above people from um corporate thought that he wasn't doing a good job because of me and all of this stuff and basically threatening me and said if i didn't stop doing you know my job that um basically i was going to uh, I'll, I'll spare the listeners the language but it was it was very traumatic it was very scary and um you know ultimately you don't expect something like that when you're mm -hmm. working for a big corporation when you are in your 20s you don't expect your whole entire sense of security and safety to be rocked mm -hmm. in that way and ultimately um it, i was in that room for a while and i remember you know there was a phone right there and i could have at any moment tried to pick up the phone but it was so frightened at first before the shackles got on right after the shackles got on there was no picking up the phone but i remember looking at that phone thinking safety is so close but so far away because i felt the need to be a good girl i felt so scared but i felt somehow like i didn't want to displease him by picking up the phone and really quickly dialing 911 which i probably could have done Mm -hmm. But I was so nervous and scared that I, I was literally panic stricken. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And then obviously I let myself, and I say let myself because I could have done something to try 
but I got shackled and then was not able, obviously capable of doing anything other than like, thank God there was no second location involved, if you know what I'm saying. Yes. But he was threatening that. He said, my car is in the back <clears throat> alley and I'm going to take you out there and all sorts of things. And that never happened. And what did happen instead is I remember popping out of my body and just talking to the angels. And I'm just like, I, I need help. I can't. I don't know how to deal with this. I'm not sure what to do. And I heard my mom's voice come through. And my mom said, you do whatever you need to do to stay alive today. Mm. And so in that moment, it just calmed me. And I just was able to kind of run this energy in my body of peace and not no more fear. And what he really wanted me to have, he wanted me to have a lot of fear. So I remember just being enough out of my body, but having enough of my mom's voice, just this gentle, sweet, loving voice to say, just whatever you do, just get out of this today. You're going to be okay. And just, you just make it out alive and just do whatever he says. And so I did, I literally did whatever he said and remained really calm. And ultimately, I think he just got bored. <laughs> you know, he got he got bored of the game of it. And he, I remember, just as weirdly as he put the shackles on me, he took the shackles off. He had a little plastic baggie that he tucked them back into. He put the plastic baggie into his briefcase. And he then unlocked this contraption off the door, put that back into his briefcase, and he opened the door. And we would, normally, I would have punched a security code code to lock up the whole entire building when we left but i just knew i'm gonna be totally submissive not do anything and so we're walking out together now weirdest thing right it's just the strangest thing here's this guy who's threatening my life and now we're walking out together and i just heard do, do not punch out that security code so i watched him punch the security code out we left and then we went on our separate ways and i was so frightened I couldn't tell anybody. Also, he told me if I told anybody, he would kill all my family. Mm. So, you know, now I'm even more fear stricken because I actually feel like this guy's kind of a kook, you know, and probably might do something. So the next three weeks I went to work every day, but I was petrified. And finally, one of my friends at work said, what is going on with you? And I said, if I tell you, you have to promise not to tell anybody. And she's like, I promise. And I told her and she said, oh, darling, I'm sorry. We, ha we actually have to tell somebody we're calling the cops right now. And that started mm -hmm. everything off. And um, ultimately, he did do some jail time. And um, I was very lucky because he said he wasn't there that night. And, mm -hmm. Right. He, he lied about the whole <laughs> event. But he, mm -hmm. one of his linchpins was I wasn't even there that night. And because they had him punching his code, which I never had out oh, on the wow. security pad, um, along with him saying, you know, I never had shackles, but he had showed shackles to two people, two employees at the location. So, you know, but again, it's one of those things where I knew something gnarly was going to happen if yeah. I took that job. And I totally, totally overrode it. And I knew it was going to happen with him. I knew that he was sort of the, the linchpin of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a really exaggerated lesson for trusting our intuition and the signs that it gives us. So I want to thank you so much for sharing that because it can be very powerful for somebody, you know, to really take their intuition seriously. And I also love how you were able to go inside of yourself and ask for help and tap into the angelic realms and really kind of flip the situation. I think that speaks volumes to the role that the energetic realm has in our physical world, right? And how much it can impact it if we just learn how to harness it. Yeah, you know, never truer words have been said because you're in a situation, but it doesn't have to go down in the worst possible way. Mm -hmm. And I have really found, and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of clients to do this process is that if you're in a bad situation, you actually can call in other energies. You can raise your frequency so that you ease out of the situation or that it's a lot lighter than mm -hmm. it possibly could have been.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm really excited to get into today is your near-death experience. And we were headed down that direction when you were kind of talking about a couple of years after this incident happened and your health was kind of spiraling. And I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. So my health was spiraling. I was in corporate. And you know, when you're spiraling in your health... I didn't, we didn't have all this information. We didn't have TikTok videos to learn how to eat. You know, we didn't have Instagram reels to show us three tips we could do to stop the pain. We just didn't have that stuff. So I thought I'm in pain. I don't feel good. I'll go to the doctor. Seems logical enough. So I did. And at every stop on that journey, I would get diagnosed with a new problem. At first it was a, a, a gut problem, right? And I would just have irritable bowel syndrome and here, take these pills, it's gonna help you. And then after a while it was, well, we think you might have rheumatoid arthritis. Here, take these pills, it's gonna help you. Well, actually we think now you have also MS. So here, take these pills, that's gonna help you. Oh. And by the way, here's some pain pills because you're in so much pain, we want you to have the pain pills. And I didn't know any better and I just kept medicating the problem and medicating the problem and the problem started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until ultimately i was at corporate i i looked a mess anyways i probably weighed 105 pounds at the time and i can remember when i got this new role in my the corporate cubicle of death And um, some girls were whispering, I think Alyssa's bulimic. And one of them said, no, I think she's anorexic because I was so skinny. But what was happening was I was neither one of those things. I just wasn't digesting my food. And I didn't know I had celiac disease. I didn't know gluten was a problem. I didn't know dairy and grains were a problem. I just knew I couldn't keep on weight. And I looked, I started to not look very good. And my nails were terrible in my hair. I couldn't grow my hair. So it was always very short. And um, yeah, so I started tracking down these problems and getting more and more and more medications. And pretty soon I got so sick. And I remember after the sickness, they prescribed steroids to kind of help cool down my immune system because they said your immune system is really attacking your body. So how many medications were you on? At one point, I was on 28 different medications was the maximum. And then I fell in with this doctor who said, you know, I know what's wrong with you. And yes, you have these autoimmune diseases, but you have viruses and bacteria in your body, specifically Lyme disease and all these co-infections, and we just need to kill those off. So I thought, well, yeah, let's kill them off. So she said, we're going to install, I mean, why not? Um, So she said, we're going to install a PIC line in your arm. It's a tube that delivers medication directly to your heart. And you're going to come in here every day for the next three months and twice a day. And we're going to infuse you with the strongest antibiotics money can buy. And so I signed up for this willingly. I signed up. And I can remember the first day after I got the pick line in and I went to her office and I was sitting in the infusion chair and they started to pump the drugs in. And I remember just losing my consciousness. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't know where this is headed, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's headed someplace good. And from there, I just proceeded to get sicker and sicker. I gained more and more weight. I ended up weighing 240 pounds. So I'm five, six. You can imagine 240 pounds on a five, six small framed person is a lot. I ended up needing a walker to get around. I lost control of my bladder. So I would wear diapers, you know, here I am not yet 30. And, um, it was so it was so much medication and so much that my body was struggling and I was married at the time and my ex-husband would tell you that I was riding that very thin line between life and death many days because it was just so much I was taking those fentanyl suckers that they give cancer patients who are dying because you know, you're not going to get much better. And so if you die from these suckers, which can kill you, then no big deal because you weren't going to make it anyway. So I was taking that level of end of life pain management, along with all of this other laundry list of medications. Um, I, I, I want to mention some pharmaceutical names, but I won't. But these pharmaceutical companies are known um, sometimes for making mistakes with their medications that can that can kill people instead of heal people. So Ultimately, that's what happened to me. And one night I didn't feel well and I went into the bathroom 
and my husband at the time heard a noise and he came and found me dead on the toilet. I was lips blue, nails blue, not breathing, and the whole left side of my face looked like I had had a stroke. But meanwhile, while I was dead on the toilet, by the way, if you're going to die, toilet's the place to do it. Absolutely the place. Takes it handles everything that happens when you die. <laughs> Yes. So needless to say, but I popped out of my body and I didn't have that experience where a lot of people will have that's a technical out of body experience where they're kind of dead, but still hovering. I went up straight into God consciousness. I popped up straight into this incredibly huge consciousness. And it was, I remember looking down and I thought, oh, my body's gone. And at that same moment, It was this feeling of taking off the tightest piece of clothing you've ever worn and just a total expansion that was delicious beyond words, that was blissful beyond imagination, that was so love filled. I I, I simply can't even describe it in words how magnificent it felt. And I always say it's the most physical thing I've ever done without a body because it was physical feelings of bliss and love and stretching of the consciousness expanding. And so even though I didn't have a body, my consciousness was coming up, 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 and I lost the Alyssa identity very quickly. And I popped up into this more God-like consciousness. And the best way I can describe this is if you've ever seen somebody sitting in front of a bank of security cameras, and they're watching all these little security cameras. So it was like little points of light, billions of them, that I could stretch my consciousness into all at once, or just some of them at a time, and go explore those consciousnesses and actually experience what that consciousness was. So for example, I could go into your consciousness and the tree's consciousness and the plant's consciousness and this other planet over here's consciousness and this other galaxy. It was so much consciousness all at once. I got to see how the universes are formed with in terms of light and then sound and then sacred geometry and then forming down into the physical layers. I mean, it was so much of a download over there all at once. It was really, uh, I mean, it was, it's mind blowing. It's the most incredible thing, but that left me, um, you know, in a, in a very cool place. And it, and I was, and I was exploring consciousness and bouncing around up there. And I remember distinctly having the feeling as that big consciousness of, I wished that more things knew I was them and they were me. Mm. I wished as this God divine consciousness that more things understood, I'm looking through them and I want the best for them and that I wish they knew I was a part of them, if that makes any sense. That does make sense. So you felt so because I kind of hear you describing it, you know, like you, you are, you were Alyssa, but you lost this Alyssa identity very quickly. And you went back to source or to God consciousness. And then you were able to see through the consciousness of everyone and everything else and beyond this earth, but into other galaxies and universes and everything. Um, But you're still kind of, I'm still like listening to you feeling like some level of individuation or separation. It's like, okay, I wish that they knew that they're me. So Mm -hmm. how does that work if we actually are all one? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it was more a sense of I could tell that these things that were I was stretching my consciousness into, I could tell that they felt very separated. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to understand that there's no separation because it's from up there. um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember or the listeners are, but that stretch Armstrong doll or that silly putty that would just stretch. It was like that. It was like the feeling of me stretching my consciousness all the way through. And at some point, whatever it was, and many things did know that they were God. Many things did know that they were divine. A lot of things that were not on planet knew that. This planet struggles with that a little bit more, I would say, right? So, um, but it was a sense of, I wish they could wake up and remember 
that they're they're still connected. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily a sense of me feeling separated from that. It was a sense of, I wish that that would remember it is me. Mm -hmm. So what is that individuation process like though for those things that didn't know that they were you, that they were God, right? Like how does that even happen in the first place? You know, that's a great question. And I think um, philosophers debate this all day long. And I think what happens personally is that people uh, come into this world, at least on planet Earth, people come into this world and get trained out of their divinity, their Mm -hmm. unity straight away. And it's often through religion of you're separate from God. I think it's the greatest lie that's ever told to humanity, quite frankly. What I learned up there, the greatest lie that has ever been told is that you're separate from God, that you're separate from source, that you're separate from, you know, the oneness of the universe. And but it's a it's a message that gets perpetuated down here all day long by many different cultures, many different religions and um You know, it's something that I think we're working to correct now. Finally, it seems like it's getting hold and there's a lot of traction there. So I think uh, it's a beautiful thing that it's starting to come back online. And I think that's why a lot of your listeners are here right now is because they're likely the ones that are helping this come back around and help come help it come back online. Yes, absolutely. And so I agree that philosophers will debate that separation idea all day long. But I'm also curious in your perspective, why it so you're talking about, you know, it coming back, the God consciousness coming back and us realizing that we're not separate from God. And so uh, philosophers will debate this all day long. But what is your understanding of why that happened in the first place you know why religion or any other societal construct has initiated that separation conditioning into us yeah so what i experienced up there and i don't know if this is going to answer your question of why but it'll give some context so what i experienced up there is down here we think in terms of good or bad right or wrong Mm -hmm. and all of that up there what i experienced is the goal is to expand Mm -hmm. and in expanding you are expanding in sometimes in polarity the top and the bottom the left and the right right the ups and the downs so we think of it as well it's bad and i even said myself it's the greatest lie ever told to humanity right but if you were going to expand something wouldn't you like to see all sides of it happen and that is what i experienced up there personally is it's there is no good or bad there is no judgment it's about expanding consciousness and in those individuated experiences it all is going to expand the consciousness out and you know I truly don't know if I was up at God consciousness level. I could have been at the monad level. I could have been, you know, I I think it would be remiss for me to say I knew 100% what level I was at. I get the sense that there is um, more to this experience of divine source energy even than we can imagine Mm -hmm. because I was only so far up in it. Um, and I didn't get to spend, you know, hours there. I, right. So it was my, my experience of it is has got a limitation on it. And I feel like it expands up even more because one of the things of the, this universe is it's always expanding. There's always more that we don't know about, and there's always more that we're finding out about. So, so yeah, that's kind of my take, but I really do think it's about ultimately one of the reasons why we got separated in this earth experiment is to ultimately expand the consciousness. Yeah, I agree. That resonates with me a lot to explore the different polarities and to be consciousness experiencing itself in a limitless number of facets and fragmented forms. Beautifully said. (laughs) Yeah, well, just reflecting what you said. uh, So I'm curious, what other, if any, major insights came from this experience? And how long did it feel like you were there? Because I'm sure it was a matter of minutes, but probably felt longer than that, right? 
you know, when they talk about in the Bible, you'll go to heaven for all eternity, it felt like all eternity. Mm -hmm. It felt there was no time, but all time. Mm -hmm. So it felt like all eternity. I felt like I had tons of, you know, things that I couldn't have explored in 10 lifetimes I got to explore. But here's what was really interesting is that I, at some point, saw in one of these balls of consciousness that I wanted to go explore a place that looked like Earth. So I thought, I'm going to go down there and check that out. So I went and took my consciousness out of there, popped all the way down, and I landed on this planet that looked almost exactly like Earth, except the sky was olive drab colored green, like this olive green color. And I actually didn't know what this was until years later, I read a book by Savannah Arianta called Frequency. And she described my experience to a T. Wow. And she said the experience that I that I had um, is one that happens when you die of drug overdose, suicide, or a very traumatic accident. And so where I was, was in the etheric layer and the astral air and i went to hang around this old boyfriend i had who liked to drink and so i went to hang around him and i noticed i couldn't speak to him but it felt very comforting to hang around him and i kind of was drawing off his energy a little bit and i felt a little weird that i couldn't speak to him but it felt good it felt healing and then i would go pop to somebody else also that had an addiction and go kind of hang around them and I was doing that for a little bit, kind of exploring different people. Now I'm on Earth. I'm, I literally can see it. I'm on Earth. I actually am in my Alyssa body mm. at that point. So I popped out of that God consciousness in my Alyssa body, sort of, um, but not 100%, but I felt like Alyssa. And um, it was a more healthy version of myself. It wasn't the sick me. It was more the me of my teens and early 20s. And this group consciousness came to me and said, hey, you know, you can stay here as long as you want. It's going to be a very healing place for you, but you will not be able to come back into the Alyssa body. But if you choose to come back into the Alyssa body, it'll be the hardest journey you've ever had. You're going to have to put in a lot of work, but it'll be worth it. And that's all that they said. And I knew instantly that I wanted to come back. And as soon as I felt that yes, I didn't say because I couldn't speak. As soon as I felt the yes, it was like somebody took me off a thousand foot building and dropped me and slammed me into pavement. And I, I remember hitting my body back into my body with a jolt and I'm like, <gasps> you know, doing one of those and I woke up and there's 20 emergency EMTs in my bathroom and my husband kneeling by my side and uh, at that point you know, that's when it got started to get very real again. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. So how did you implement into your life moving forward, whatever new consciousness you had access to during your near death experience? Yeah, well, you know, it took me a long time. I mean, after that night, I after they, they, they had to pump me full of Narcan, which is a drug that blocks all your receptors for drugs. And so I then um, had another incident in the ambulance and I woke up in the hospital, legs flailing, I'm strapped to a gurney, you know, I'm just in full withdrawal. And I remember thinking, oh, my life is broken. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally broken and what I'm doing isn't working. It's actually killing me. And I had that realization. And so to be honest, it was a five year long process of integration because it was a lot of consciousness to intake over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I learned about uh, sacred geometry. I learned about sound healing. I learned about how the universe is formed. I learned about quantum physics and I'm trying to keep all of that. But meanwhile, my I have a drug addled brain, right? So it was a long haul of me getting back and doing little mini things as I could. I first had to just get off some of the drugs and build a healthy mindset. And I remember the very next day after the near death experience, the doctor wanted me right back in the chair infusing again. So I went back and um, I remember sitting in the infusion chair and this man's voice came through and it said, 
at least a thousand times that day. You're getting better and better every day in every way. And I didn't realize this until years later. It was a man named Emile Couillet who had long since passed, but I heard a lecture of his and I, and I knew, oh my God, that's that guy's voice that was playing in my head. How could that be? Wow. But at first it started with affirmations. And then I knew that I had to research sound frequency. And so I started researching sound frequency. I got some meditations and I would just lie in bed and meditate with sound frequency and healing theta waves. And um, I would envision myself being able to walk. And so I finally got up enough energy after doing that for about a month that I started to be able to use my walker more and get out of my house and do little walking bits every day. So it was a long haul, a series of many different healing modalities that I tried. And, and literally when you're that sick and your life is broken, mm -hmm. I tried everything. I mean, I did everything from acupuncture, which is wonderful and I highly recommend it to monkey healing, which I don't know that I can get behind. What is uh, monkey healing? Well, it's where a nice lady calls you on the phone and screams at you like a chimpanzee for about an hour. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, you tried it all. Exactly. So, but when you're desperate to heal, you'll do anything. And yes, I think you will. That, that's a place where many people are at today, just desperate to heal. But then I did some real practical things. I hired a nutritionist and I remember looking at her and she was older than me. And I saw this sparkle in her eye and I thought, whatever she's got, I want that. And so I literally just did everything she told me to do. And in one of our first meetings, she said, you know, I think you might really be having a problem with gluten and dairy. And I said, oh no, I've eaten these things all my life. What are you talking about? And she said, I, I think you might. So I started cleaning up my diet. I started really clearing my body vessel and making spirituality a priority. And then you know, my whole entire life started to change bit by bit, but it was a long road and it wasn't an easy one, especially one of the things that happened for me is all my psychic gifts got turned up really loudly and I was no longer able to avoid them. And wow. so that was a bit of a process of integration of what the heck is this? What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What's going on? What am I feeling? And then sorting through that. Yeah. So how do you experience your psychic gifts? Is it clairvoyance, clairaudience? Are you able to see people's energy fields? How does information come to you? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah. So it, it seems like over there, um, you, ha you have all of that anyways, all of the, all of the energies tapped into you. So here, um, now I have a lot of clairvoyance, a lot of clairaudience, and a lot of clear sentience so I'm a body channel. So I'll feel things for people, even when they're not feeling them, I'll be able to kind of scan and say, okay, but let's tune into this. And they'll be like, oh yeah, I do. I actually, there is something there. Or, oh yeah, I have this, I've been having this going on, whatever that this is. And so um, it's, it's an interesting process, but when you don't know how to work with those things, it's harder. So I had to do some research on what the heck is this? What am I seeing? And, and my own sort of sorting process of assigning meanings to things. So I would see enough people with black around their mouth and, you know, I'm looking at them in the face and they've got all this black around and coming out of their mouth. And, and then it was having enough enough time and experience with people and, and doing a lot of sessions because I started doing this work for a living and doing a lot of sessions to get like, oh, okay, somebody who has black around their mouth is really struggling with speaking kind words about people. They are tend, they tend to spew a lot of gossip and they tend to, and it'll even show up in the teeth even you'll see it in the teeth and the mouth energetically. And so it's just finding my own little bank of this they're showing me a picture of this and that's what this means or i'm seeing this on somebody and that's what that means because i had enough experience with understanding the way this shows up energetically mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah it's a learning curve for people to start uncovering what how am i receiving information what symbols am i getting and what do they mean so it can be a process of unpacking that Yes. And everybody, you know, now I teach, I've got our Divine Light Energy Healers Academy. So I teach this stuff for a living now and to practitioners and everybody's bank of symbols is different. So just because mm -hmm. if a thumbs up to me means a, one thing, a thumbs up to you could mean something totally different, especially if you're from Thailand, where thumbs up also means giving somebody the bird. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you did talk about your healing journey quite a bit. And you talked about everything. I mean, you tried everything from A to Z, right? And you told about how nutrition was super impactful for you. But I'm wondering what other healing modalities were really transformational for you along the way? Yeah, so a big one for me is sound healing. In fact, I still use sound healing in my work today. Um, I feel like sound frequency, what I what I got to experience up there is sound is a precursor to physical formation. And it's a precursor to sacred ge geometry. In fact, sound forms the sacred geometry. So when we use sound, it then can impact the body structure and the energetic structure on levels that bypass the mind, which most humans need. They need to bypass their mind. So sound is this beautiful way to sort of break up some energetic structures happening with the body and the energy channel in a way that is a little easier on people and can sometimes circumnavigate or circum. I guess, circumvent um, years of therapy, you know, or years of this healing process. So I love sound frequency. I love uh, to use the crystal alchemy bowls, as well as I like sound frequencies that allow you to get into that theta brainwave state or to that gamma brainwave state. So that's another thing that I was showing up there. We've got to change our brainwaves because right now, most people on the planet are in high beta, which is a very stressed state, and you cannot access your intuition when you're in high beta. You're just not going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to access your own voice or the collective consciousness, but you're not going to be able to access that really amazing, lovely divine consciousness, angelic consciousness, whatever sort of beings you're working with, you're not going to be able to access that well. So getting your brain entrained into being able to quickly and easily go into alpha at least or walking theta is something that's really powerful for people. And when people can start to be more conscious of being in alpha brainwave states, even when they're stressed. You know, it's just such a beautiful thing to do because then you have access to all of this guidance, all of this wisdom, all of this intuition to, can just flood in and your life goes easier. Can I give you a quick example of how of that works? Yeah. So I live here in Hawaii and I was going down to the dealership to get a new key fob for my car. And I was going to then go get an oil change at the local oil change place. And we don't have a Whole Foods here, but our version of that is called Island Naturals. And it's where you get all your beautiful organic produce. So I was going to go get my oil changed, then go to Island Naturals. And I'm driving down the road and I heard, today's not the day for your oil change. Go straight to Island Naturals. Now, it's 3 o'clock. Well, I think it was about 3.30. So that doesn't really make any sense because Island Naturals doesn't close until 6. But I've learned to 100% listen to my intuition at this point. And so I drive to Island Naturals and I grab my bags from my car. I walk in and the lady says, better hurry up. We're closing in 25 minutes. And I said, wait a minute, it's 335. I'm looking at my phone. It's 335. She's like, yeah, but we don't have the staff today. So we're closing in 25 minutes. Now, had I not listened to my intuition, had I not even been tapped in, I would have never heard it. First of all, mm -hmm. had I been in high beta and stressed, which I was stressed that day. But because I've learned to not be in that high beta and rewired my brain, I then can hear the messages and then I can avoid going to get my oil changed and get all my yummy organic produce. Yes, I love that. So practical, such a readily available example. And this is something that we can all tap into that can, like you said at the beginning, be life saving or just be a convenient part of our day. Exactly. And that's the thing that I eat like candy because I don't eat candy, but I do love the deliciousness of being so tapped in to your divine connection that you hear those messages and everybody can do this. You don't have to die on the potty uh, mm -hmm. to do this. I'm not there's nothing special about me. Everybody has access to this. Mm -hmm. Every single person on the planet has access to this, but it does take some training. It does take yes. retraining your brain out of what we as society have trained your brain into. Mm -hmm. But boy, when you do, it's delicious. And the little miracles that happen every day in your life are Oh, and the life just starts to happen more easily and more effortlessly. And you just feel like you're totally supported all of the time, even when, you know, there's hard things going on. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like whatever downloads or wisdom that told you when you were in that near death experience realm, that it's not going to be hard, easy, it's going to be a very difficult journey, the hardest thing ever, but it's going to be worth it. It sounds like it's been worth it. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, it, those those five years are some of the hardest years of my life. And mm-hmm. It took everything I had to get through it. There was a point in time where I wanted to kill myself. I just, it was so hard. And I thought, I cannot do this. What was I thinking coming back? I literally had that thought. And, um, but now on the other side of it, it's so Mm. worth it. And I get to help people every day tap more into their intuition and their divine gifts, which we all have. And I get to also live in this beautiful, this beautiful place and, I feel so grateful and blessed every single day, but mostly because I get to be an example of what it looks like to heal your life. And what I believe is that if you want to, you can. Mm -hmm. And no matter where you're at on your stage of healing, you can allow yourself the time and space and and there's modalities out there now right that are all over the internet they're all over TikTok and on youtube and you can just with a couple clicks of your phone you can actually immerse yourself in some healing modalities that will really change your whole entire world and you will be imagine you'll you'll be amazed to see and here's a little something that i'd like to share if i can mm-hmm. you know one of the things i think we forget about is as at least in America, we love these quick fixes. You know, we have these take a pill and you'll lose 50 pounds overnight. And we have that sort of stuff. But if you knew that if you started working on your, whatever it is that you're trying to heal today, that in a year you could feel totally different. And that in seven years, you'd actually replace all of the cells in your body because if you think about it this way with every what they showed me up there is with every thought you think with every feeling you feel and every bite you take you are choosing your body's experience you are choosing your reality and so if you literally just go through your day and ask okay is this bite that i'm taking feeling the the most high vibration version of my body the healthiest happiest version of my body or is this bite actually contributing to disease is this thought i'm thinking fueling my healthiest happiest version of myself or is it contributing to me being stuck right where i am and is this feeling i'm having am i denying this feeling am i pushing this feeling down and not allowing it to free flow and creating a clog in the body right and so if you just are asking yourselves those questions every day it it really is amazing what can happen with the body even in six months but a year and then in seven years boy if i told people you can have almost a brand new body in seven years and you'll look younger you'll be more glowy i mean it's not sexy the seven year the seven year change is not sexy but it's a lasting one Mm -hmm. Yeah, just implementing those lifestyle changes and choosing things that agree with your system, not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. Yeah, those are powerful words of wisdom. I think that's great advice for anybody who might be out there struggling with their health or wanting a quick fix and having to grapple with the reality that that's not actually going to work. Yeah, it's not long lasting. I mean, it may work for a minute Mm -hmm. is the thing. And quick fixes are quick because they're quick. They're quick to fix and quick to break. Mm. And so those lasting results are the ones that actually take you more than a minute. And they take you digging in a little bit. And they take you really rooting down into the healing process and allowing that healing process to start to take hold of you. But boy, is it worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you are absolutely a beautiful, shining example of what that can look like. And I'm curious to know what your offerings are. Would you mind telling us about those? 
Yeah. So, well, one of the things that I have that you guys might love if you're listening is the Raise Your Vibration Toolkit. So this is something that anybody can do. In fact, kids love to do this. Nice. They love to listen to the audios. Anybody can get it. And it's a fun activity to do with kiddos too, but it's also fun to do on your own. So it's a little toolkit of about six audios or maybe more that will help you to raise your vibration and work with your own energy system and the energy system of those around you and start to create different mm -hmm. outcomes for the day. So that's a really fun one. And then I've got the Academy where I, it's called the Divine Light Energy Healers Academy, where I teach practitioners, chiropractors, acupuncturists, coaches, healers, um, sound healers, Reiki practitioners to use the type of healing modality that I learned up there, which is a blended modality. Um, it's a it's a version of some newer energy and breathwork techniques along with some hermetic um, ancient traditions. So and some advanced brainwave technology. So it's kind of blending all the things together, but it really gets clients those fast you know, faster results that take hold because you're mm -hmm. working all four parts of their body system. And that's one of the things I think that's still broken in Western society is we tend to just work with the mind or just with the energy system or just with the physical body, but we're not working on all four body levels at all the at all times. And that's one of the things that I teach people how to do is how to work on all four levels at the same time. So it's lasting and transformational and clears it out of each layer. Yeah, beautiful, a holistic approach that really empowers people to become the master of themselves. Exactly, exactly. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to heal people. I want to mm. empower them to heal themselves. Because when you heal yourself, you then know that nothing can take you down. You then know that you have the power within you. You always had it actually, but you now know how to claim it and own that power. Yes, I love that so much. Awesome. Well, this time went by super quick. Your story and your journey and the wisdom that you carry is so fascinating and inspiring. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I want to check in and make sure, does this interview feel complete for you today? Or are there any final words that you have for audience members? Yeah, no, this has been such an incredible discussion and dialogue. Thank you so much. And I would just leave everybody with this, you know, you are here for a reason. And uh, my my biggest driving belief is one of those reasons is to reprogram some of what we've been programmed into believing as a human being. And this is your time to repattern this. This is your time to heal those ancestral wounds. This is your time to heal those things. And you can be different, but know that when you do the work to heal it, you're actually creating such a ripple in the field that is beyond, it goes out past this world into the galaxy. And so the work you are doing is so worth it. And I'm so grateful that you are doing it and you're doing the work. So thank you guys for having me here today. Yay. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I love that. I love hearing about that ripple effect, especially from somebody who has seen it, who went straight to source, you know, because it's one thing to talk about it or to read about it, but to hear it from somebody who really has had that near-death experience, I think is very powerful and at least for me, reaffirming. So thanks again for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Chelsea. Absolutely. And thank you to all of our wonderful listeners and viewers. This has been another episode of the Soulful Self podcast. I'll talk to you all next time.